This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 450, recorded on July 14th, 2017. Hi, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me here in New York City on this Bastille Day, Dixon de Pommier. Hello, Vincent. It's Bastille Day. It is. You know what that celebrates? I do. What is the it? The storming of the Bastille. <laughs> it's the weather like out there. It's storming. <laughs> yeah, behind me, I can never see it here. <clears throat> no, no, it's, uh, it's it still foggy. Raining? It's foggy. It's probably still raining. 21 Celsius and cloudy. <clears throat> Yeah, it's going to rain all day. Guess who's celebrating Bastille Day out of the country? No, I have no idea who. Donald Trump. Also joining us from southeastern Michigan, Kathy Spindler. Hi, everybody. It's great to be here. <laughs> you should say finally. <laughs> just We should just say we spent 30 minutes yes. trying to uh, hook up Kathy, and it was my fault at this end. But we figured it out. Yay. You didn't want to not have to join Isn't that us. what San Andreas said first? <laughs> yeah, right. Also joining us from Western Massachusetts, Alan Dove. Good to be here. It's uh, overcast and has been drizzling pretty much all week. And now it's kind of cool, actually. Hound of the Baskerville weather. Oh, that's good. And joining us from uh, Oregon, Rich Condon. Oregon. Hi, everybody. I always, say, How are you doing? I always say Sun Valley, but that's not right, right? That's Sun, Sun River. Close. Sun River. 50%. You can say bend. You can say bend if you want to. South that's, bend. That's twenty minutes inaccurate. That's right. So it's uh, eighty degrees uh, Fahrenheit. Uh, low humidity, twenty-seven nice. Celsius. The weather here has just been absolutely gorgeous. Richard, do you have any forest fires? Do you have forest what? fires near you? Do I have what? Fires? Do you have any forest no, fires not, near you? No. There, not is there a connection problem between you and Rich? I don't know. <laughs> there always always has been. <laughs> Yes, I would agree. <laughs> we have a guest here in studio who has been patiently waiting for 30 minutes to start TWIV. He's been on TWIV before. He was on TWIV 265, which seems like ages ago. He's a professor in the Department of Microbiology at the Icon School of Medicine here at Mount Sinai in New York City. Ben Tenuver, welcome back. Hello, everybody. Thank you. Welcome back, Ben. It's good to be here. Got a good ring, right? Indeed. And Ben's been watching us struggle with audio problems. Yeah, for those of you who have not seen the studio, it is, is very impressive. With a <laughs> myriad of wires and one was loose. One was loose. It's not Vincent's fault. That's all it, it takes is just one loose I'll wire and it blame. screws up the whole thing, doesn't well, it? Well, he tried to stir the oxygen <laughs> tanks and then things just, you know. I will take the blame. It's <laughs> no problem. Uh, Game of Clones was your last twiv. That's right. That's back a- in 2013. Wow, it's a long time wow. ago. Time flies. Yeah. Tell me about it. <laughs> has it been a good time or no it's been great it's been great your science has been cr- progressing very well oh thank you in fact the reason you're here is because i heard you speak at the american society for virology a couple of weeks ago it was an evolutionary biology session something like that yeah, that's correct oh, nice. and i said that's a beautiful story we need to get you on twiv so here you are it's nothing like being in new york city and you can come right up here it's true right? one train away as long as they work. The trains? <laughs> yeah, they've had some problems recently. <laughs> we we do uh, have good subways here in New York City. So uh, your talk was focused around a paper that was just published. So uh, we will talk about that. I had a couple of follow-ups from last episode, or from the last few. The first one is from a few episodes ago, but it's one sentence. So I had to read it. Hitoshi writes, the correct pronunciation... For tentomushi is tento mushi, not tentu mushi. <laughs> he has tento right. or ten dash two. It's not ten dash two. It's tento. a foot thing, not a time thing. Tentomushi. <laughs> and I had overly enthusiastically pronounced it with an Italian accent and tentu. <laughs> tentomushi, which is um it's a ladybug or ladybird. Is that what tentomushi is? Ladybird beetle, I yeah. think, yes. Let's type it into Google and see if it returns the right thing. Yeah, I think that's how we got <laughs> yeah. on the discussion of Tento Mushi. Tento Mushi. Yeah, there, and then there's a, uh, and in fact, there is a um, animated series called <laughs> The Song of Tento. 
Ten Tomushi, not Ten Tu. Ten Tomushi. Tomushi. Thank you, Hitoshi. Actually, this was part of another email he sent to Twip. Uh, then we have one from Paul, which is relevant to today's uh, guest. So we'll read that. Paul writes Twivoli. That's a new one. Twivoli. Does anyone know Tivoli is a place in Italy, right? Hmm. No, no, it's in Copenhagen. Denmark. Yeah. Uh, there's or, a Tivoli in it. Tivoli Gardens, right, Ben? Yeah, he's nodding. And then there's also a. I got some backup today. A theater. <laughs> a theater. <laughs> the Tivoli the Theater, yes. Yeah. Anyway, Tiv- Twivoli is good. An excessive heat warning covers southeastern Pennsylvania for tomorrow, but presently 32C, 50% humidity, 27 M. Per, I don't know, MM per hour winds. Must be. What is MM per hour, Alan? Um. Miles a per typo? Hour. It's an extra I guess that's typo. supposed to be it's miles a typo. per hour. It's a typo. Thanks for episode 449. One question and one comment. Question. The article discussed the method a mammalian virus used to suppress RNAi suppression. It implied that RNAi could be common in mammals but routinely suppressed by mammalian viruses. In any event, it definitely identified a fairly straightforward RNAi suppression mechanism available to RNA viruses. So why wouldn't such a suppression mechanism be common in plant and invertebrate viruses that face RNAi as their primary barrier to success? Uh, yeah, that's a that's a great question. Uh, I think we will probably talk about this as we uh, continue. Um, but in, in short, um, it's a double-stranded RNA binding protein, which is a, a very good suppressor of interferon signaling and also a suppressor of RNAi signaling because Double-stranded RNA exists in both pathways, mm. um, but many suppressors of RNAi silencing actually do it in much more creative ways, uh, either blocking AGO or cutting loops or uh, blocking the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase or transportation of the SI RNAs. There's a lot of other ways to block mm. RNAi as it's seen in plants or invertebrates. Yeah, I'm sure we'll come back to that. And then a comment from uh, Paul. Occam's razor originally referenced primarily that, quote, entities, i.e., hypothetical entities, must not be multiplied beyond necessity. Mm -hmm. (laughs) This is different from a general bias in favor of simpler hypotheses. For example, the razor would prefer a more complex hypothesis that hypothesized one enzyme to a simpler hypothesis that required two. We're having a little Occam's razor arc. I say, that got a lot of action, Occam's razor. It's an interesting, interesting plaything. Great content he ends with. All right, then we have one from someone you may know, Ben, Chris Sullivan. Oh, yeah, we'll talk about him today, too, I'm sure. We're Twiff hosts. I'm glad that you are dedicating back-to-back episodes to cover the exciting topic of RNA silencing and antiviral defense in vertebrates, something my lab thinks about. As you mentioned uh, us, As you mentioned us in the previous episode, I often do that. I call people out just to see if they're listening. I go, hey, Ben, what do you think of this? Hey, Chris, <laughs> or we do. I thought I would briefly respond. The paper by Q et al., similar to recent work from Cullen and Ding Labs, clearly demonstrates siRNAs matching viral sequence can arise in mammalian cells at least at some level in the right context. It also provides further genetic evidence consistent with an antiviral activity of RNA. I, I think a picture is emerging in the field as a whole that there are at least some hallmarks of antiviral RNA in mammals, the debate now moves from do these hallmarks ever exist to how meaningful are they? Mm. Although the issue of whether RNA is a relevant mammalian antiviral response still remains unresolved, I think all parties can agree that some hallmarks of antiviral RNA exist but are more context-dependent and limited in mammals. Whatever your favorite take on the larger issue of antiviral mammalian RNA, I think most would agree that RNA is clearly different between mammals and invertebrates, whether due to differences in the effectiveness of mammalian versus invertebrate VSRs, or more likely, in my opinion, due to the differences between mammalian and invertebrate host biology, viral-derived siRNAs are of lower abundance and likely less importance in mammalian cells infected with wild-type virus. Further, our own published and unpublished work, combined with work from numerous labs, including Pfeffer, Cullen, and Sousa labs, shows that there are clashes between the effectors of the protein-based mammalian antiviral response for example, RNA cell PKR interferon, and multiple components of the RNAi machinery. Thus, it remains unclear to me how much antiviral RNAi matters in mammals where the protein-based response appears to have superseded and even counters components of RNAi. It's been fun to watch the science unfold around this issue over the years. Yes, the dialogue has been heated at times, but as long as this is kept to a debate about the data and its interpretation, this is what makes science work. 
I commend all parties for the strife they have endured to stand up for their perspectives when, as too often happens, it would be easier and less risky to just ignore those papers you don't agree with. Antiviral mammalian RNAi is an important issue. I am glad the discussion continues. This is good for science and gets us closer to true understanding. As always, thanks to all of you for what you do. Listening to you is one of the enjoyable parts of my job. Chris, how TWIV is now a job. That's not good. No, 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 no. no. His job. No, oh, I see. Yeah, I see. I was going to no. say, you know, you don't have to be working to enjoy Twitter. No, I was articulated very well, though. You like that? Yeah. Well, a, ni- a nice thing about the um, the controversies in RNAi is that the papers that criticize other papers, they also compliment them. <laughs> <laughs> so, Ben, before we uh, dive into this, um, you're Canadian, right? True. Also right. American. Well, you were born in Canada, right? Correct, correct. So you have dual citizenship. Yes. Now? Well, and you went to McGill as an undergrad, no, right? That's correct. Was Nahum there when you went? Yes. Yeah. yeah. He's still there. Yeah. Yeah. He's yeah. still there. <laughs> <laughs> this then, is Nahum Sonnenberg for those who. I'm don't know. I'm repeating your history because I remember it from Twiv 265. You got you went to Harvard, right? Correct for a postdoc. Although I wasn't with Nahum uh, while at McGill. I so was McGill with was John an Hiscott. undergrad. Where was your PhD? Uh, both at McGill. Both at McGill with John Hiscott, with, yeah, exactly. who's now in Florida, is that right? I think he's in Rome now. Oh, he moved to Rome, that's, that's right. Mm-hmm. Word to the grapevine. Uh, and then a postdoc at Harvard with Tom Maniatis. Correct. Who's he's in this building, now. by yeah, the way. Like Do you feel his presence? I can kind of feel it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we've come full circle. Now, uh, the, the talk you gave at ASV was based on this uh, letter in Nature that was just published. RNAs, three nucleases from diverse kingdoms serve as antiviral effectors. And um, maybe you could tell us a little bit about the authors. You have two co-first authors, Lauren Aguado and Sonia Sonia Schmidt. Schmidt. They're from your lab, right? Yeah, they're both great. Uh, Lauren Aguado is a graduate student who just defended and will uh, be doing a postdoc to be determined. Uh, Mm -hmm. She's she's, uh, deciding between what labs. I won't say who they are. Uh, and Sonia, <laughs> Sonia has uh, one is very familiar to you. Uh, and Sonia Schmidt uh, is at Nature Communications now. She just started a, a job as an editor there about six months ago. Cool, cool. Uh, other authors include uh, Jared May, who is in the lab of Ann Simon. Uh, they're at University mm-hmm. of Maryland, and they do all of the uh, plant virology for us. Uh, kind of similarly, Leah Sabin uh, was in the uh, lab of Sarah Cherry, who's at UPenn, mm-hmm. and they do the fly stuff for us. Uh, Marilyn Pennis is a lab coordinator in my lab who has a fantastic pedigree. She comes from Charlie Rice's lab. Uh, and uh, Daniel Blanco-Mello actually was the first author of the paper from Paul Benash that you covered. That's right. It's right. like a, a lineup of superstars here. Uh, <laughs> Jehi Shim is a, was a student in my lab. She rotated in my lab and has since left uh, to go to bigger and better things. David Sachs is a bioinformatician, MIT trained assistant professor at uh, Mount Sinai. Uh, and uh, Jean-Pierre Levreau is at the Pasteur, and he did a sabbatical in my lab and brought zebrafish uh, biology to my lab. So he did the zebrafish oh, work. Cool, cool. Do you have zebrafish growing in your lab? Not anymore, but but you did. Man, I was jealous. I I, I feel like if I do another sabbatical, <laughs> uh, it's going to be in zebrafish work for sure. So one nice. of my one of my former PhD students is doing that zebrafish at Case Western now. Uh, he had done he did a postdoc with Tim Hudspeth here at uh, Rockefeller, and now he's got fish tanks out in Cleveland. That's a good title, Fish Tanks in Cleveland. There you go. Isn't that, that's from Finding Dory too, isn't it? Isn't that where they're all going? <laughs> it is. <laughs> Could be. Um, now this, um, this paper was actually just a part of your talk. You spent 10 minutes introducing this, and I wonder if you could sort of bring us through the same Sure. Have you brought your slides with? Sure, I didn't bring any slides <laughs> with me. Uh, I'm going to do my best okay, to do Kathy, this. Kathy, don't worry about not seeing this part. <laughs> uh, and so, I can't see it either. Right. A, a lot of this came from, I did a sabbatical with Marco Vicnuzzi, who does virus right. evolution. And so I feel a, a lot of uh, the work we do in my lab here in New York took on a bit of an evolutionary slant as of recent uh, uh, years. You know, I noticed that. Right. So wait, wait a minute, Ben. You've been there long enough to have done a sabbatical. Yeah, <laughs> I've been. So August first will be my ten year anniversary. In New it's amazing. York. Holy cow! Oh, time flies. Oh, jeez. I'll say. But the sabbatical was fantastic. In fact, my lab is about to become a part of a Pasteur Institute, so we're a satellite of Pasteur now. Be darn. And that's, so, and Marco and I work great. very closely together. Nice. Uh, uh, in any case, um, evolutionally speaking, I think uh, my history has been in how cells respond to virus and. I think an interesting take on all of this, which comes out of Eugene Koonin's work, is if you look to uh, prokaryotes in general, all the viruses are DNA-based. 
Uh, and of course, their defenses are things probably as simple as anti-sense, um, of course, restriction factors. Um, so you have both the use of small nucleic acids or nucleic acids and nucleases. And the idea of RNA interference and CRISPR is really the combination of joining these two pathways. So you combine the use of a nuclease and the use of nucleic acids to provide specificity to an otherwise nonspecific nuclease, and you can generate a CRISPR system or you can generate an RNAi based system. Now, bacteria don't have RNAi, but they do have an ago based DNA targeting system. So all of their defenses are. DNA-based targeting systems because their viruses are DNA-based systems. Mm-hmm. Ask, there are I, some. There are some RNA bacterial right. viruses. Yes. Is there no defense against them? Uh, so it's been demonstrated that some of the CRISPR systems do act on RNA, um, but the, the RNA virus, uh, I think, is, is more susceptible to. Um, actually, you know, it's a good question. I don't know um, how bacteria deal with uh, RNA viruses if they don't have a CRISPR system. All right, so you've got surplus graduate students, no doubt. Get them on it. <laughs> <laughs> now, There's a project. Well, they're, they're, I mean, the RNA viruses are few and far between in right. the prokaryotic world. So why is that? Do we understand? I, I think, so I was talking with Nels Eldy about this at the Evolutionary mm-hmm. Symposium, and as a shout out to Nels, his talk was far better than mine, and it was amazing at that satellite. But symposium. you're here, and he's not. Yeah, well, he, was, he, has, <laughs> he has his own show. <laughs> yeah. In any case, you um, want a show too? Yeah, sure. <laughs> um, uh, in any case, the uh, now, now you've got lost me my train of thought. Sorry, but, sorry. Uh, R- R- RNA page. RNA page. RNA page. Oh, why? Oh, yeah, right. So, um, I I follow a lot of Eugene Kunin's work, who's really big on how viruses evolve, and he was quoted as saying that that it's probably or could be due to, he's very careful about his words, that it could be due to the lack of compartmentalization, that as an environment for transmission, the lack of structure is more conducive to DNA replication. But in mentioning this to Nels, he corrected me and said that actually in the prokaryotic world, it's like I'm, I'm apparently 10 years or 20 years behind on my knowledge. And that, yeah, exactly. DNA. That prokaryotic cells, in fact, are more compartmentalized That's than we give them credit for. Mm-hmm. So I guess the short answer is I don't know. We gave them credit for it. <laughs> right. In fact, it's recently been shown um, by the Poganos, Poganos, sorry, at UCSD, that some phages encode a nucleus like structure. They infect cells and they make this thing that looks like a. Right, nucleus. right. That's trying to credit the birth <laughs> of the nucleus yeah, via yeah, virus, right? Yeah. I love it. I love it. So, <laughs> so I, I, I can't explain all of okay. these things to you, but um, I think it is quite clear that with the uh, birth of eukaryotic cells, we see an explosion of RNA viruses. And this mm. would have posed a huge problem given that we would have also evolved or taken along antiviral defenses that suddenly became entirely ineffective because now we were fighting an RNA world instead of a DNA world. And and that's really what this paper is trying to address. It wasn't what we sought out to address, but that's kind of the topic we hit on, that when eukaryotes emerged from whatever soup they came from, um, how did they deal with with this explosion of Mm -hmm. RNA viruses that was thought to happen because of all the membranes that were now in existence in these cells that were perfect for RNA virus replication? And those things were not Available in bacteria, maybe, and that's, that's why the they, they didn't proliferate there. Okay. That makes sense to me. I like it. Mm-hmm. But there clearly was an explosion in the eukaryotes, and then right. the idea so, is you got to defend against And so it. one of the things I love is if you look to plants, in fact, it's the exact flip, that almost mm-hmm. all viruses that infect plants are RNA virus-based. There are also exceptions, just like there are to the phage, mm-hmm. but most viruses are RNA-based. So you have a complete uh, you know, 180 on what a cell now needs to do to defend against virus. What can, can do we understand that? Well, so that's basically the birth of the RNA interference pathway, and so mm-hmm. the RNA interference pathway, which was explained last week really well by Alan Dove, is a, a triple combination of um, you need to have an RNA dependent RNA polymerase, essentially, which is going to generate RNA from RNA, of course, and b- make beautiful double stranded RNA substrate that can then be cut up by dicer. And then those small RNAs are what's going to provide specificity to an otherwise non-specific nuclease, which are the argonauts, which we also discussed last week. Mm-hmm. And that is like the three basic components of any good RNA interference system. And if you look to those three components in plants, which there are many members of each mm-hmm. of those categories, we can see that they are stolen from archaea mostly. So Dicer and Ago are stolen from archaea, and the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase is thought to be stolen actually from a virus uh, of... of um, Bacteria. But these RNA polymerases in the plant genome are 
they did they just copy small RNAs, right? They can't copy an entire viral genome. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah, just okay. pieces. Yeah, just pieces of it. And in it, but we don't have those in mammalian cells. Right? Ah, this is going to become very pertinent too because they play a really important role. So RNA dependent RNA polymerases don't just make the original substrates that feed into the RNA eye defense. Mm. They also amplify it. Right. So if you imagine a giant oak tree that has to now spread its immune system far and wide, <laughs> it's not sufficient enough that the source be always virus infection. You need to be able to move those small RNAs and amplify them throughout the, the organism. That, and, uh, Dixon, Dixon was questioning that uh, in in the mammalian system last week. So that's yeah, it's a critical issue. Although it's important to note, though, that in many, uh, like flies, for example, use RNAi but don't, in fact, have an RNA-dependent RNA polymerase system. Mm-hmm. But Raul and Dino and Carla Sele showed really well that basically from the site of infection, so if they look at the mid-gut with GFP silencing, that as you leave that site of infection, the silencing of those small RNAs um, diffuses out very rapidly. Mm-hmm. And so I would argue that the larger the organism is, the more important it is to have an RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. So again, this is our first point we're going to hit on that suggests that, in fact, RNAi is probably not a relevant antiviral defense in mammals. Okay. So insects are pretty small, doesn't have to diffuse very far. Plants are, trees are pretty large. Our trees, you need a polymerase to amplify it. Sure. But, but you could imagine that the virus itself could provide the polymerase to amplify it, right? But that doesn't happen. Well, the virus wouldn't have an interest in doing that. No, um, no. but you, it could you be, could... be a, it could be a, a, a uh, what do you call corollary damage? What do you call that? Uh, collateral. Collateral, collateral, collateral damage, collateral. right? But even, even that, there's a problem with that as far as kinetics is concerned. So that you have to wait for the virus to make the small RNAs to defend against it. Whereas interferon, which is the, the predominant vertebrate antiviral defense, you can send that message way ahead of the virus so that cells can fortify and, and ready themselves. Let me be a devil's advocate. Let's Please. say in a mammalian cell, I'm going to let you go and proceed. I know, I'm sorry I'm interrupting. No, no, I don't want to do all the talking. Um, but you should, because you're the expert. In a mammalian cell, the RNA comes in, and as we said last time, you don't want to chop it all up. So you let it replicate a little bit, then you chop some of that up, and you target the genome with that. In the meantime, the virus polymerase is amplifying its genome and making more substrates for um, Dicer. Does that make sense, or is that not right Right thinking? So I, I do think that in the advent of deep sequencing, we see now evidence that you can get some spurious cuts of Dicer, yeah. possibly Drosha, in the cytoplasm. But um, there's a number of problems with without making long double trend RNA or being amplified mm-hmm. with an RDRP. But I agree you can that's RNA dependent RNA polymerase, sorry. Um, but you you can get around you, you could physically or I guess argue that um, without an RDRP, without an RNA dependent RNA polymerase, you might have an RNA interference defense still. Certainly we do in insects. But there are other issues um, in that the enzymes we have, so Drosha or Dicer uh, in this particular case, um the dicer that exists in invertebrates actually has this extra domain in it that doesn't mm-hmm. exist in the dicers that ex- are used for RNA interference. And this came up actually in your discussion last week that what you really need is a dicer that can readily cut and then move on and cut to the next thing and processively move across to generate lots of siRNAs to provide a very strong defense against your virus. Right. Our dicer is actually terribly designed to do that. So this is work from Ian McRae, uh, Jennifer Doudna, and Flipowitz that they've demonstrated that the architecture of our dicer is really good at cutting only one time and only on the end. And mm. it's a very inefficient process. It doesn't actually use ATP. And so it doesn't cut oh. and then release and cut again. I mean, mm-hmm. That's something else that you would expect. Got it. To be there. Okay. All right. So it's really more of a slicer than a dicer. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. Um, okay. So where? So basically, regardless of whether or not RNA exists in mammals, you you have to you have to envision a world where RNA was the predominant defense following the birth of eukaryotes because RNA viruses came to the scene very quickly and, mm-hmm. and with quite a surge. So. In order for us to be here today, we would have had to come up with a very good RNA-based defense rapidly. And we, according to, to the evolutionary biologists out there, we have a, a sense of how that may have occurred. Um, and then something funny happens, though. So as, as time passes, so let's say you know, one billion years ago, and we're, we're splitting between plants and animals, um, we see uh, essentially somewhere early on in eukaryogenesis, we see a duplication of RNA interference. And this is going to 
complicate things, but it's important that we go through this. So the defense system, the RNAi defense system, essentially duplicates. All the genes duplicate. And half of them we use for developmental purposes, mm. and that's microRNA biology. And the other half we use as antiviral defenses. So if you look at flies, if you look at plants, both of these pathways exist simultaneously. Mm. One is used to fight viruses, and the other is used for sheer development, cell health, cell development, cell differentiation. Um, it's actually an interesting theme that we see throughout life. In fact, it also goes the other direction. So toll-like receptors were actually developmental products that were repurposed to become antiviral products. So we see actually both examples of these directions. So we see this split following early eukaryogenesis that now all eukaryotes have microRNAs and all eukaryotes have RNAi to start. Um, the duplication of microRNAs happens separately in plants and animals. So animals have very different microRNAs than plants, even though the pathways are very similar. Mm-hmm. That's kind of how we know RNAi came first. And so in, cool. in mammals, then what we see, which is, which is incredibly interesting, and I think Chris Sullivan already touched on this, is that it appears that we completely dropped RNA interference. So we kept microRNAs in, as a developmental tool, but we dropped RNA interference as a defense. And in place of RNA interference, we added this interferon system, this protein-based system that demands actually in very similar um, means. Again, we, it's not that virus entry induces interferon. Actually, the system of interferon is designed to turn on following some initial level of replication. So the system is designed to recognize uh, aberrant or weird-looking RNAs that are the byproducts of virus replication. So this is you know, RNA with 5' ends that don't have a cap, that are exposed 3' prime, prime triphosphate, um, um, caps that lack methyl groups, mm-hmm. uh, double-stranded RNA, and double-stranded RNA is a big one. So you can see it, there's a common element here where the initial detection signal to alert uh, beacon starts with double stranded RNA, at least, at least in one case. Do you think that this transition occurred as eukaryotes were getting more complicated and, and that the RNAi was no longer sufficient, say for body size, maybe? That's exactly what I think. So yeah. that's my opinion. There's uh, obviously no proof of that, but yeah. um, I would argue that as we got bigger, uh, RNAi, especially as we lost the RNA dependent RNA polymerase, um, Right, so plants have lots of RNA-dependent RNA polymerases, mm-hmm. but flies have none. And so, as we we are evolving, we would have had to have developed an effective RNA interference in the absence of an RDRP, which would have made it very difficult. Do you think the uh, precursor, the LUCA, had an RNA polymerase? Uh, back. The last universal common ancestor. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think. Um, well, no, I think RNA-dependent RNA polymerases were the invention of viruses that were then adapted. Okay. So if you go back in time, <laughs> which someone said, and only I can do that, um, you get back into these um, strange uh, hybrids of animal plant cells, like Euglena, for instance. And uh, I know Plasmodium has one of its members that have some plant genes included into its genome. Can you use this system to tell whether those are actually plants or animals. Oh, I, so that's a great idea. I actually did not know that. And uh, I, yeah. maybe we can talk a little off the show. And I, oh my. <laughs> th- I think that's a great idea. So I uh, certainly, um, again, we'll probably get touch on this in a minute, but we look at Siona and like the earliest, you know, a chordate, but not a vertebrate per se. Exactly. And, and so they lack both RNAi and interferon. So we know that there was a time where they had nothing, neither RNAi nor interferon. And they must have had some beta version of an antiviral defense. And that's what the Nature Paper is about, that we believe that yeah, beta this, ver- it's a beta well, version. It's, it's the first. Not beta max, beta version. <laughs> got it. I got it. That's great. Okay. All right. So, in fact, I think one of the interesting things about the creation of the interferon system in amongst um, uh, vertebrates is, uh, as again, Chris Sullivan alluded to at the beginning of the show, that they appear to be mutually exclusive. And there's actually a, a growing number of papers that convincingly demonstrate that in order for a cell to even show remnants of RNAi, this is now a vertebrate cell, it has to be completely uh, incapable of responding to interferon, that the two systems are mutually exclusive. Oh. And this also makes a lot of sense then why we see no evidence of RNAi, because 99.9% of our cells are interferon competent. And so mm-hmm. it's hard to... It's, it's hard to understand the findings of the paper you discussed last week, especially given that there's quite a bit of controversy, even amongst, I mean, there's 21,000 plus papers on RNAi since its discovery in 1998, and there's five talking about RNAi in mammals. 
Right. And even amongst those five, there is a lot of conflict in those five. So uh, Olivia Vonier um, had the science paper you discussed, the Notavirus right. uh, right. podcast or uh, episode. And in there, he pretty clearly shows that as – so he can find evidence of RNAi. Now, whether or not it's functional is a separate question altogether, but evidence that you can see the small RNAs in the cutting – in stem cells, but as they differentiate, you lose that activity. Mm -hmm. And side by side in that paper was another article from, from Xiaowei Ding's lab, which I have a lot of respect for Xiaowei. Um, but that one showed it in somatic cells. So right off the bat, the very, you know, the first new coming mm -hmm. papers already had this conflict. And right. most recently, uh, Risa Sousa came out with this great study that demonstrated basically that you had to kill the interferon system. And when you did that, you could see small evidence of RNAi emerge in those cells. Meaning if you did, mm. you know, a high seek run, you, you know, 150 million runs, you could see 0.001% of those looked like perfect RNAi substrates. And so they seem to be mutually exclusive, these two systems. Now, in addition to the paper we did last week, there was also a flu paper published last year. Correct. So that was also Ding and Kate Jeffries. Um, uh, and so, um, I don't think there's any uh, secret that I wasn't a fan of this paper. I wrote in a, a letter, I wrote it, right? I wrote in a comment to it, and I only yeah. did that because we have so much data that suggests that that's not possible. Uh -huh. So that actually very much like the paper uh, you discussed last week is trying to make or is making the claim that the reason why people like myself and many others don't see RNAi in mammals is that all mammalian viruses encode potent suppressors of RNAi silencing, and so you have to kill that uh, mm -hmm. that viral suppressor in order to see RNAi. And that's that's a fair argument, except that we have, we've taken, so we're we're in the business of uh, of playing with viruses. So if you think of Game of Clones that we talked about, in Game of Clones, we were taking influenza viruses and we were incorporating microRNAs into them, okay? So if you mm -hmm. think back, right? So remember, microRNAs came out of RNAi. So all the machinery is, is essentially the same. Right. And so if we put in a hairpin, those hairpins feed into the microRNA machinery and become small RNAs against whatever you want to target. And the beauty of the system is that it's all based on shape. So you can change the sequence of that hairpin to whatever you like. And so if you want to make a virus that targets GFP, you can make a microRNA that by shape looks like a beautiful microRNA substrate. The virus makes this transcript without problem. It feeds into that machinery and the machinery cuts it up thinking it's an, a bona fide microRNA. Except that in this particular case, the sequence that comes out of that machine is a perfect complement to <laughs> something, say GFP, right? And the complementarity is a really big deal here. It's actually a huge difference between microRNAs mm -hmm. and RNAi. So RNAi, the small RNA is coming from the virus. So by definition, the complementarity is always perfect. And that allows Argonaut 2, the one Argonaut we have that has this capacity to actually cut and work processively so it can cut, and then it can recycle that, R that small RNA and do it again and again and again, mm. which is what you need to wipe out. This also came up last week. Whereas in microRNAs, it's never perfect. And so basically the entire RNA-induced silencing complex just sits on the mRNA, and it either causes deadenylation or um, translational arrest on, on that particular mm. message. Wow. And so microRNAs are fine tuners, and they are perfect for development, but they are not good for mm -hmm. being antiviral because they're too subtle. Right? But what we're doing here is we're exploiting the microRNA machinery, but what we're producing because it's perfectly complementary is behaving like an antiviral RNAi because it's perfectly complementary. That makes sense so uh, far? Yep. Yeah, so perfect. we can take a virus and we can, we can give it the capacity to knock out whatever we want. And so we have, we've published the study. This is, came from Asiel Benitez. It's a cell reports paper, and it wasn't even the, the, it wasn't even the purpose of the paper. Hmm. But we can design a flu virus that feeds into this pathway that makes an siRNA against itself. In the presence of wild type NS1, which is its double stranded RNA binding suicide protein, sisters. And, <laughs> and the antagonist of what they would claim would be RNAi, and we can make a suicidal virus. Nice. And we can do this with Sendai virus, with VSV virus. And so, if the argument is that all mammalian viruses have potent suppressors of RNAi signaling, those viruses shouldn't be possible to make. And so, I mean, I'm happy to share these with anybody in the world who would, yeah, who has the, the, <laughs> at least has the uh, permissions to use them. Um, but they're potent. Um, self-silencing uh, viruses. Yes. And so it's hard to kind of wrap your head around those inconsistencies. So that so, should probably be done with the enterovirus 71 from last week. And you would predict it'll just silence itself, right? Right. So the data from that paper was incredibly provocative. So don't get yeah. me wrong. Like I read a paper like that and yeah. it makes me think twice. And um, I know labs, I know at least three or four labs in different places in the world who are now trying to reproduce a lot of those assays. That's exactly what I was going to ask. <laughs> now, how many other people have found the same thing with the same system? 
Right. So like I said, 21,000 plus papers on RNA <laughs> and there's five papers. No, but that, I mean with this particular. Right. No, no. So unless there's something very distinct about this model system uh, yeah. and, and people are looking, I know uh, Ryan Langloy at the University of Minnesota is directly looking at Entrovirus 71 to see if right. he can see silencing. Does, it, does any of this concept play into the oncogene silencing world? Could you machinate and engineer oh, I see what you're saying. this kind of a system so that when you encounter some aberration of a normal gene, you can just knock it out. Yeah, you, you can certainly exploit it as a tool. Uh, we work a little bit with John Bell, who's an oncolytic virologist who works with VSV. Okay. And there you can take VSV and essentially arm it with siRNAs that would target the entire genome. So you make a library of 55,000 okay. know, different members, and then you could, you could passage that library through your cancer of interest and select for a virus whose replication now had increased because the siRNA it came armed with was particularly good at helping that virus replicator kill. Oh, okay, so that's... It seemed to me that this viral suppressor that they identified in Intro 71 works, right? So why is that activity in the genome if it, if it never has to encounter um, So RNA? this that's a great question, and I think this is... Um, uh, a common issue in mm. the field that's created a lot of the controversy is that there's a lot of proteins. So NS1 of influenza is another great example. NS1 of influenza, multifunctional antagonist of mm -hmm, influenza. Mm -hmm. yep. uh, a great experiment by uh, Adolfo Garcia Sastra years ago now was he took influenza and he stripped it of its NS1, so a Delta NS1 virus. And this virus is so attenuated, you can't, you can't grow it anywhere. It induces truckloads of interferon and According to some, it induces an RNAi response in mm. mammalian cells. However, if you take this and you put it into STAT1 knockout mice, it regains all of its virulence, <laughs> suggesting that what it's doing is it's blocking yeah. double-stranded RNA or sequestering double-stranded RNA as well as copious other mechanisms. But it's, what it's really doing is, is masking the capacity of the cell to respond to virus in an interferon pathway. But if you take that NS1 and you put it into plants, it also blocks RNAi. Because right. what it is is a double-stranded right. RNA binding protein, and there's lots of double-stranded RNA substrates right. in RNAi. And so this is, this is the is problem. There a dicer, is there a no-dice mouse? Uh, it would be uh, embryonic lethal. So microRNAs, because they're developmental, yeah. you, you can't mess with them. And so Brian Cullen's no-dice cells have been great for this because you know, 293T cells arguably are, are barely human, but they're at least vertebrate. Um, yeah. And so it, it's amazing that he actually managed to select for a clone that can function or at least yeah. continue passaging without any microRNA biology. But those cells have no difference in virus replication unless the virus requires microRNAs. And so DNA viruses like herpes viruses love microRNAs because, because microRNAs play the long game. They're perfect for latency and controlling like transformation mm -hmm. and they're more of Chris Sullivan's work. So they do some great things on the long term, but the virus has to stick around for a lo the long term, which is also interesting why hepatitis C virus is an exceptional rule mm -hmm loves microRNA-122 and hepatocytes, mm -hmm. but it's also a chronic RNA virus, and it's using yeah. microRNA-122 in the most unconventional manner. Does, does no dicer cells improve the replication of the Delta NS1 at all? No, not at all. Not at all. So no. that would, that's the key experiment there. But the well, 293Ts are pretty lousy they're cells, up, for, yeah. but even for flu, so multi-cycle replication okay. of influenza it requires very specialized cells. Got it. Yeah, and part of the problem with this is in order to do any of these experiments, you have to go to highly artificial systems, at which point you have to wonder what the in vivo relevance of this is, especially given the evolutionary overlap between RNAi and interferon. That's exactly right. And, and uh, one last statement about RNAi in mammals, and that is there really should be more genetic evidence for this as well. So uh, we all know from from Twivo that you know, you know one of the, the hallmarks of of uh, antiviral genes is gene duplication, and you you see right. you know DN over DNS, so non synonymous versus synonymous mutations. You mm -hmm. should see evidence of positive selection on, on antiviral genes. And so there's this great study where they look at flies and they look at dicer one versus dicer two. So one is microRNA biology, and the other one is antiviral. Mm -hmm. And dicer two undergoes rapid positive selection, and dicer one does not, which is not surprising. Right. Except that when you look to uh, now you move to humans, you look at Dicer and Drosha, you see no positive selection. In fact, even at the mm. ago level, so if you look at, we have four agos, ago one, two, three, four, and we have four things called peewees. Mm -hmm. And so peewees, peewee RNAs are actually quite interesting. It's also, also a small RNA mediated system, but it's, it's restricted, heavily restricted to uh, germline cells, so sperm and egg and like very, very specialized cells. And it's involved in small RNA inhibition of retroelements. 
And what we see is if you look for positive selection, there is no positive selection in the agos, but there is positive selection in the peewees. So again, just genetically speaking, you would expect that not to be the case if RNAi was a bona fide functional defense in mammals. What about, uh, so we have two dicers, is that correct? We only have one. One, and there's no positive selection on that. No, correct. Wow. I think that's because because that's dicer. the microRNA dicer. <laughs> that's yeah, correct. that's right. right. So how about nematodes, or, or lower verte- lower invertebrates, I should say? What is their antiviral system like? So they have a fully functional RNA fully f- I and it has right. including fully. RNA dependent RNA polymerases. They, C. Elegans uh, is they even give the small the RNAs to their offspring to, to help. Isn't that kind of where we found a lot of these small RNAs? That's correct. Yeah, that's that's, right. that's Andy Fire and like Craig Mellon. Like maternal antibodies. <laughs> Nobel Prize 2006. And the, and the ignored Victor <laughs> Ambrose, right? <laughs> yeah, I, know. I have no opinion on that. <laughs> but yeah, no, I, I, I know Craig Mellon because he, he, he didn't get his he didn't get a Nobel Prize. No, he it? did a lot of uh, very fundamental. Yeah, uh, wet genes, right? Yeah, for sure. Hmm. So um, anyway, that was a kind of a digression about RNA in mammals. No I good, good, but it's, it's oh, relevant. No, we, should, good. we should lead into your paper right. now. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> paper? We're going to discuss a paper. <laughs> well, actually, a nice lead into this paper is in fact that we can make these viruses that self inactivate. So it, the Game mm-hmm. of Clones was was based on flu, right? Mm-hmm. But one of the things that we tried to do actually it was a rotation uh, student that came into my lab. Her name is Jillian Shapiro. Mm-hmm. Now a patent lawyer, um, but <laughs> she uh, she had a very successful rotation. So she basically came in, and uh, I had her take the same kind of microRNA structure that we were putting into influenza, but I had her put it into Synbis virus. And so, for those of you who don't know, Synbis virus is essentially a contagious mRNA, but it replicates <laughs> exclusively in the cytoplasm. And um, so this shouldn't work because we're feeding into the microRNA machinery. And so the very first step in microRNA biogenesis is RNA pull two derived transcripts get cut up by something called a microprocessor, which is Drosha in human cells and a, it's by RNA binding protein called DGCR8. Now, what really matters is that Drosha is a very close cousin of Dicer. So we really have two RNAs, three enzymes. We have a third in the mitochondria, but its function is unclear. So basically we have these two RNA3 enzymes, they're very close cousins of each other. And in fact, Drosha looks more like Dicer of, of, uh, of most eukaryotic species, including mm-hmm. uh, prokaryotic species. You should probably tell people that an RNA3 is... Yeah, sorry. An RNA3 is a, is a nuclease that can cut double-stranded RNA. And its signature that makes it RNA3 is that it, uh, it has this hallmark two nucleotide uh, three prime overhang on the ends of it. So it's, it's the hallmark after cutting that makes it an RNA3 enzyme. So, uh, pardon my naivete, but tell me again the difference between Drosha and Dicer. All right. So, in microRNA biology, so developmental biology, let's say, you make a hairpin in the nucleus from a regular RNA pull to transcript. In fact, it can be in the intron of a, a mRNA. And Drosha sees it first. So, Drosha can actually see a hairpin in the middle of a long non-coding RNA mm-hmm. and cut it so that it's now like a 60 nucleotide hairpin with a signature two nucleotide overhang on the three prime end. That okay. gets exported into the cytoplasm where Dicer then processes it one more time. And so, okay, so, so and, and, and both of those are RNAs three activities. Correct, so actually Dicer recognizes the two nucleotide overhang as it's to be a substrate for itself, and it cuts the loop off, thereby generating two essentially 21 nucleotide duplex RNAs that's, that are imperfect based on their nature. So they're never, they're never perfectly complementary. Where does the name come from, Joshua? I you actually know? don't know. Because Dixon asked me today. I didn't know. Right? You know, <laughs> these are trivial questions, but it could clear up the mystery of... Uh, is part of a Drosophila, DRO? Uh, I actually, I have no idea. Yeah, okay. I, there's nothing online. Yeah. And in fact, in mice, the gene is called Arnazin, and it goes by a few other names uh, in different species. So there was so. another name, Pasha, which is uh, like Drosha, and I wondered where that one came from also. Pasha, I can almost understand, but... Yeah. So it's related to Drosha? Yeah, they said okay. that. That's at least according to Wikipedia. No, no, no it's part of the fly machinery, the microRNA fly machinery. Oh, okay. Okay. All right. Um, okay. So, one of the this whole story starts with this really odd observation that you can take a microRNA that requires the Drosha's first cut, the nuclear event, and you can put that into a cytoplasmic virus, and yet you can yield something like eighty thousand copies of properly processed RNA, despite never having been in the nucleus. All right, so this should not have happened. Because right? Drosha is nuclear. Right, so Drosha is in the nucleus. So it has no business. This, this should have been impossible. I uh, hope that's clear. Mm-hmm. Um, and so the first thought was, okay, maybe it's specific to this microRNA that we've put in. Maybe it's specific to the virus. 
But now, uh, eight years later, we've put microRNAs into every every virus we can get our hand. Everything that has a reverse genetic system in it, we have put microRNAs into them, and they always function. They always get cut. They always get processed. They always get loaded into agro. It, it's there, we have yet to find an exception to the rule. In fact, I would love to find an exception to the rule. I remember hearing Julian speak at ASV. Oh yeah, years right. ago. Yeah, years ago. Yeah, and you guys were saying we don't get this. We don't understand why these are being processed. This is a nuclear enzyme, right? And so, thankfully, <laughs> I. Uh, uh, Christian Mandel uh, came up with a, a, a report in the same year we did with the exact same discovery using TBEV uh, and a different microRNA. So it's not just my lab or something. Born crazy. encephalitis virus, Dixon. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, and so in any case, it, it's quite clear that, long story short, that Drosia moves out of the nucleus into the cytoplasm following virus infection. Um, there's now many other labs working on this. It's any, vi- any virus infection? Yeah, any virus, uh, including double stranded RNA transfection, but not interferon. So this has nothing to do with interferon, nothing. And that's an important point. So we can do this in cells lacking MAV, cells lacking the interferon receptor, cells lacking any of the IRFs, NF kappa B, you name it, 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 it works. What's the trigger? It's a good question. So we're, we're working on this now. Uh, in fact, how we're working on this now is we made a Sendai virus that is green, Mm-hmm. That makes an siRNA that targets its own green transcript. So basically, when you put it into regular cells, it's not green. When you put it into no-dye cells, it uh, is green. Nice. And then we throw it into a, lib- a CRISPR library, a whole genome CRISPR library, and then we fax sort out the cells that are green, <laughs> and we sequence them. Nice. So it's, it's actually a really nice system. So nice. you can expect that oh. paper in about six months. I think. Nice. <laughs> Love it. Come back. Yeah, my student will kill me if I tell, him, tell you what it is. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, let's, of course, let's just of course. Put pause on that. Yeah. Um, so, so in any case... Um, it's clear that it's phosphorylation related. So it's post-translational modifications to Drosia. It happens very rapidly. Cool. Um, and so we kind of got into... But the, the reason is that every virus can do this. So it's, it's either a different mechanism or something common among stress related or something it's like about, that? It's about entry. So it, it, it has to do with... Entry, okay. I, I think cytoskeleton disruption is right. what it comes I'm sorry. to. No, that's fine. Okay. That's fine. I'm happy to share. <clears throat> um, so anyway, what we wanted to... We've been trying to get at for a long time is... is why this matters like it's, it's kind of hard to, to write a grant without any explanation as to this bizarre activity oh, no, that we're that all the, I can um, do that every time not in this present administration mm. uh, and so in any case what we did was we used CRISPR technology and we built on Brian Cullen's cells because another problem here is that if you want to study the consequences of Drosia you have to deal with the complications that as soon as you remove it you also remove all microRNA biology which which is a, a, an entire you know right. you're, you're creating chaos in the cell that has nothing to do with what you're studying. <laughs> and so what Brian provided to us was essentially a, a baseline where now microRNAs were no longer relevant and we could knock out Drosia in those cells and now truly compare what what does what is a cell like that has no microRNAs versus a cell that has no microRNAs and no Drosia. And we could... Why why is it possible to make no dice cells at all? It, it's it's hard. So we've tried independently from Brian. In fact, we're still trying. Nice. Um, it, the problem is, is that as soon as you eliminate microRNAs, the first attribute of the cells that you get is a complete block of cell cycle. Huh. And so selecting for a clone that successfully targeted Dicer is hard because all yeah. the cells that were targeting was unsuccessful out compete yeah, and grow yeah, out. Sure. So it's hard. Wow. Um, so there, there must be other things wrong with those no dice cells that allows them to get the best. That's well, they're two nine three T cells, so there's a lot of things wrong with them. <laughs> <laughs> How uh, many chromosomes are they missing? Yeah, who knows? <laughs> yeah, two nine three T cells are a, are a very unique uh, cell line for Kathy, sure. Kathy, what were you going to say? I was going to say, and they're probably not even embryonic kidney cells, from what I've read. No, I think they're like <laughs> neuronal, right? It's they're thought to be yeah. neuronal and stem stemish. But yeah, Kathy, stem-ish. do they have do they have pieces of adenovirus genome in them? Right. Yep. Yeah, that's where they came from. The left eleven percent or something, yeah. right? Okay. Uh, so probably any- probably everybody's two nine three cells are different too. Yep. So right. yeah, we actually recently did this. We uh, so I we do a lot of sequencing in my lab. I have my own Illumina instrument, and uh, we actually compared HeLa cells, A five four nine cells, and two nine three cells in a variety of labs. And I can tell you that sure. they, they are sure. quite quite different, in fact. So this could solve a lot of arguments among investigators. I use the same cells. I got a different result. Why the hell didn't you? For use, sure. You know, you're using Even, different yeah, reagents. That, you're do- that discussion has been ongoing for the for answer a while. is. Yeah, they, yeah. yeah, we're having a violent agreement. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so you can do these experiments in no dice cells. Right, so we'll, what we can now do is we take CRISPR and we knock out Drosia, and we're going to compare always what we call RNAs3 knockout cells, because they lack Dicer and Drosia, which are our two RNAs3s. 
and we're going to compare. Was that hard to make the the drosha nut? No, that was pretty easy. Okay. Uh, and then um, I say that, but it was like a student's eight months work. But, yeah. uh, <laughs> it was easy. He said, go do it. <laughs> uh, and so we compare, we compare RNAs three knockouts to dicer knockouts. And of course, the first thing we did was simply throw in every virus that we had and said, does it make any difference with regards to virus replication? And very rapidly, it was obvious that all positive strand RNA viruses grew much better in the presence of a cell that lacked drosia and negative viruses uh, didn't care at all. <laughs> uh, sadly, we didn't try any uh, DNA viruses. Rich, I'm sorry. In fact, pox viruses is on my on my uh, radar to do. What about double stranded RNA? Uh, so we look at um, we have looked at them extensively. So if you transfect these cells with double stranded mm-hmm. RNA, or you treat them with interferon, we of course we immediately just RNA we RNA sequence everything. Um, and so if you just look at a transcriptional landscape or a transcriptome landscape of these mm-hmm. cells, uh, there's no there's no significant difference. So if you look at the genes that are differentially expressed with a significant P value, there's nothing there you've ever heard of. Like there's no, and they don't grow better in, in these no, RNAs three. No, I mean, they're two, again, they're two, nine, three T cells. So there's not a lot of physiological relevance yeah. there, but they're both replicating very well. All right. Um, and in fact, we do the necessary experiments where if you put Drosia back into those cells, you now actually instill a greater antiviral activity. So you can restore this by simply restoring Drosia back into those cells. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I think what made this uh, perhaps more interesting is, again, kind of uh, with the evolutionary take on it all, uh, we started investigating how, how universal this activity was. And so we had uh, Jean-Pierre try it out in zebrafish. So we took Sinbis virus that made a microRNA and we had him actually put it into zebrafish. And lo and behold, zebrafish also processed this microRNA. In fact, he could take a morpholino against Drosia and stop that processing, so suggesting that in the same way mm. the activity we were looking at in mammalian cells now also exists in fish, which dates it quite far back. And we already had an idea from Sarah Cherry that we knew this worked in Drosophila, so it works both in mosquitoes and in flies. Mm-hmm. It's also Drosia dependent there. But the one that really blew us away was uh, for Ann Simon, we got a hold of the turnip crinkle virus reverse genetic system. And so we put the same microRNA that we've been putting into every cytoplasmic virus into turnip crinkle virus and had her put it into a Rabidopsis protoplast. And lo and behold, we can see by RNA in situ that the virus is completely cytoplasmic, but it has no problem processing and making a mature microRNA in, in its correct form. Is Drosia dependent as well? or So it's a little hard to say. The answer to that is probably yes, but um, yeah. it's harder to say because uh, Drosia, as a Drosia named gene, doesn't exist in plants. They have four RNAs, um, so they're called dicer like one, dicer like two, dicer like mm-hmm. three, dicer like four. And so we haven't gone back to figure out which of the four it is um, because they have so many, and they're a little bit more difficult to work with. So it's not simply transfecting in double stranded mm-hmm. RNA into these okay. cells. It's a little tougher. And so that dates it back to 1.1 billion years where plants and animals split and this activity still exists. And so um, in giving this talk and in discussing this work, it's really tempting to think about this in terms of, well, maybe it goes even further back than that. Um, and so we started looking at, I'm kind of jumping ahead now, but um, if you look at now these RNA3 knockout cells, what we start doing is we start introducing RNAs 3s from a variety of species. So having what we did was we started with Drosia and we cut it up into little pieces and we figured out which piece was the most important for this activity. And not surprisingly, it's the RNA3 domain and a double strand RNA binding domain. Mm-hmm. And so we cloned the versions of that that exist elsewhere in the, in the, the, in all of life, basically. So we grabbed it from, um, um, sorry, Staph aureus. Um, no, sorry, we dug it from Pyogenes. That was our like our mm-hmm. our bacterial version. We grabbed it from an archaea that lives in swamps. Uh, we got it from yeast, uh, and then we took it from uh, a variety of different species all throughout the, mm-hmm. the tree of life. And we just said, well, if this is truly universal, you should see this activity exist regardless of where we look for it. And in fact, that is exactly what happened. No matter where you take your RNAs 3 from, it is always effective at blocking positive strand RNA viruses and not negative strand RNA viruses. And that you do in your RNA 3 knockout. Correct. Nine, three correct. Cells, right? correct. And so we're using basically Synbis virus, um, um, Sendai virus as our, our negative control that's not right. being impacted, and we have Langat virus as a, another another rescue system where we can demonstrate this work. So, what, what what how old does this put it now at having looked at these other organisms? Okay, so there's a, a small complication here in that. Well, it's not a complication. Um, so it's definitely 
the birth of eukaryotes would have had this activity. So Drosia had mm-hmm. this RNA three domain. So we can't really talk about Drosia. You should really talk about the RNA three domain, right? So Got it. Got it. actually, even the history of the RNA three domain, so dicer of RNAi, mm-hmm. is actually the ancestor of MDA five, which is the ancestor of mm. uh, Rigi. So in fact, I would argue that there's probably uh, a, a, cont- uh, a continuation of all antiviral defenses as mm-hmm. viruses mm-hmm. are evolving and changing. Um, in any case. Uh, in the in uh, prokaryotes, or where we see RNAi or CRISPR systems uh, dominate, uh, the for example in um, the pyogenes RNA three that we used, mm-hmm. that actually is a component of their CRISPR system, mm. and so they use wow. RNA three to make the the tracer RNAs mm-hmm. that then feed into the Cas nine system, and so when we initially submitted this paper, we were really excited that in fact it connected. CRISPR to RNA interference, mm-hmm. and then all the way to interferon. It was kind of like this universal connection, um, and uh, we 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 had a reviewer that definitely did not agree with that. And I mm-hmm. agree with this reviewer. So if you're listening, I uh, <laughs> I, I do agree. Um, and their point was very valid in that we see RNAs three usage in the type two CRISPR system, but there's many other CRISPR systems where mm-hmm. RNAs three is not implicated in, which would suggest that it's likely that the CRISPR system either also started utilizing the um, attributes of RNA3 as an antiviral independently, or you could argue that CRISPR, uh, the type 2 CRISPR system, used this, and it in fact did develop into to the eukaryotic defense system. And so we initially liked the latter theory. Um, now we talk more about, okay, let's mm. say birth of eukaryotic cells. And what I really like about this idea, and then I'm going to be quiet, is that you can envision that having an RNA3 enzyme. So RNA3s are involved in all kinds of RNA metabolism for ribosomal RNAs and a variety of mm-hmm. other features. So it's an important cellular gene. And so when we became eukaryotic cells, we would have had this anyways. And so going back to our story where all DNA viruses suddenly flipped the switch and now we're dealing with RNA viruses, it was the beta version. It was perfectly situated. So all you had to do was take this, this RNA3 enzyme from the nucleus and shuttle it out into the cytoplasm, mm. and you had this bare-bones defense yeah. against <laughs> positive strand RNA viruses. And they wouldn't have seen negative strand RNA viruses because that came on much later on the scene. And so we get into the mechanism by uh, CLEX, by a, a number of different techniques that basically suggest that the way this works is that RNA3 simply recognizes long hairpins, not surprisingly, mm-hmm. and binds to them and clamps them and and prevents the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase of the virus from simply replicating its material. Mm -hmm. So it's the most simple, basic defense. And it's not overly, I mean, this is not a a defense that that can hold a stick to it. It just grabs the genome and acts by steric endurance. Exactly. And so what I love about this idea is if this is our beta version, it's pretty easy to envision that the the natural byproducts that would have come off that interaction. So Mm -hmm. it's it's an enzyme, right? So it's going to still cut and so now you can envision that, okay, then the defense is this antiviral clamp binding to pieces of genomic RNA. And the byproduct of that, whether you use it or not, is going to be small hairpin RNA. Right. And so suddenly it's not a hard jump to say, well, that's probably how RNA I evolves yeah. because you just have <laughs> cool. to start using those small RNAs and suddenly you give yep. birth to the RNA interference pathway. And so that's kind of the overlying hmm. uh, idea that we're putting out there. And so later on, you're already detecting double-stranded RNA, and you can you can build the interferon system. Exactly. Right. So wait a minute. So so Drosha is recognizing uh, hairpins in the incoming genomic RNA of the positive strand viruses. Is that the idea? Correct, and that's why it's it's impacting positive strand RNA viruses and not negative. And strand. not negative because negative strand viruses are encapsidated. Correct, and their RNP, their ribonucleoprotein complexes, are so tightly bound that mm. they're resistant to both nucleases and proteases. Uh, okay. Cool. Kathy, what were we going to say? Kathy? I was going to say, I really like this explanation of the clamp because you mentioned it in the paper in Nature, but you don't have time to explain it there. And so that was one of my big questions is clamp. <laughs> yeah, this, yeah, this paper was three times longer when it was submitted. It was uh, We had to really crunch it at the end. Page limits. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. So, do you need enzymatic no, so, uh, activity to that, do this? Actually, no. It's an interesting question. So, um, what we were doing was overexpressing a variety of mm-hmm. droshes in our knockout cells. And so, in an assay where you overexpress it, you do not need enzymatic activity. But that's not to say that the activity we see... So, right now, we're actually building mice that will have um, droshes that can't move and that will be able to answer a lot better mm-hmm. uh, questions like that. Um, but so, right now, we don't, we don't really know. Cool. 
That's just great. So one of the things you did, you didn't touch on, you you used selection to figure out what was being bound and that right. showed you it was hairpins, right? Right. So this is a, uh, it's called CLEX, uh, the acronym I, I probably should, it's System Evolution of Ligands by Exponential Enrichment. Um, <laughs> certainly not an app that I created. <laughs> yeah, that helps a lot. Yeah, sorry. Right. What you do is you take uh, you take a, a diverse library. So we have we we generated a pool of ten to the six hundred and fifty mer oligos, and then you essentially in vitro transcribe them in in terms I could best describe as sloppy on purpose. So mm-hmm. you you give it excessive nucleotide, excessive enzyme, and you and you purposely do a lot of rounds to create more and more diversity in your starting pool. And then what you do is you take that pool and you add it to the given protein of interest that you think is interacting with RNA. So then you IP your protein out of that pool of heterogeneous RNA, which is, of course, a very messy uh, um, procedure. You wash a lot. And then what you do is anything that was retained in that column, you re-PCR, you retranscribe, and you repeat. And so the idea is that with every round of immunoprecipitation, PCR selection, and then another round of immunoprecipitation, that you are constantly getting closer and closer to the highest affinity nucleic mm-hmm. acid substrate. And so when we do this with uh, with GFP, you'll you'll always find something. So you'll we pull out uh, some random looking uh, RNA oligos. Uh, but when you do this with Trosha, you don't get anything that's sequence specific. And again, that's not surprising. But uh, we get 150 MERS that when you put them into RNA folding programs, they make these beautiful hairpins that look just like microRNAs, which again uh, is what you would expect. So yeah. they're long skinny things as opposed to the GFP controls that are all branched. Right. So yeah, no branches. That's important. Um, and this is also um, how we think it probably recognizes many positive stranded RNA viruses is that the five prime and three prime UTRs or the subgenomic promoters of many different viruses have very long unstructured or unbranched uh, hairpins that they use for a variety of purposes, including internal ribosomal entry, uh, cis acting elements, kissing loops, a, a variety of different uh, purposes. So, so. I have one question uh, just relating to the Celex thing, something else that probably uh, had to get dropped. But in this figure 3A where you show these different hairpins uh, and you have this scale from 0 to 1 and little colors on them, what, were, what are the colors and the 0 to 1 yeah, that, telling us? That's kind of funny. I actually had to pay for color charges on this figure. And I, I have buyer's remorse because <laughs> when the figure was shrunk down to this size, you can't even tell what it is. Um, the colors represent the confidence interval uh, that the structures uh, are made or, or they're in that exact position. It's um, an output of RNA hybrid. So it's supposed to tell you, you know, the confidence that those structures are forming. And so you want the darker colors uh, in general, so towards zero. And the ones are basically, it's, you know, when you're trying to crystallize a, a protein and you have some unstructured area and it doesn't show up in the crystal, it's kind of the equivalent of that. Got it. Okay. Yeah, I had my magnifying glass out. So. Yeah, honestly, you know, so it used to have nucleot. The actual sequence was in there. And they wrote me and they said, oh, you know, we can't read the bases because it wasn't vectorized because it came from RNA hybrid. And mm-hmm. so we had to, we couldn't vectorize it without losing resolution. So we had to manually go in, draw circles, and then put in each nucleotide. Wow. And then they said, well, when we shrink it down, you can't read it anyway. So maybe you should just make it colors. But honestly, it was hours wasted for this, this one panel A. Mm. Hmm. So basically, Drosha is an ancient primitive antiviral that clamps on to plus-stranded RNAs, right? Correct. It's still around because it's used for microRNA biogenesis. So if you infect today a cell, a mammalian cell with a virus, does this play any role at all? And does it have any antiviral activity? So we see if you remove Drosha mm-hmm. in an interferon-competent system. So we have also mouse embryonic fibroblasts where we can conditionally eliminate Drosha. So the moment you do this, of course, you're you're adding a, a complicated yeah, yeah, uh, sure, component sure. to the equation. Right. Um, but we see half log to one log reduction in titer, suggesting that it is participating, but it's, it, it doesn't really hold a stick to the interferon system, which again, isn't surprising because okay. the interferon system is the be-all, end-all of how we deal with viruses. Okay. Now, part of your talk, you mentioned this uh, work where people had made a transgenic mouse with a picornoviral polymerase. Oh, I'm glad you mentioned this. Tell me that story and why it's relevant to this. So this actually goes to this idea that the interferon system and the RNA interferon systems are mutually exclusive from each other. Mm -hmm. So this came out of a group, the senior author is Moses Rodriguez. It was a PLOS pathogens paper. And from what I understand, actually, it comes out of a company, and this was not their intent at all. 
But as a control, they were building an RNA-dependent RNA, well, a transgenic mouse that encoded the coronavirus RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, just basally. And so they successfully created this mouse, and this was actually their control mouse. But what they found, I think, af- well after the fact, uh, for whatever they were actually looking for, was that these mice were uninfectable. And the reason for that is that baseline levels of RNA-dependent RNA polymerase was essentially grabbing up host RNA, turning it into double-stranded RNA, which then would activate the interferon system. And so if they looked at interferon-stimulated genes in these mice, they were just always on, like not in a subtle way. If you looked at Rig I or interferon-induced, you know, mm. I, all these all these interferon-induced genes, they were at a protein level uh, – thousands and thousands of copies at baseline compared to what yeah. should be the norm, which is not there at all. Um, and I think they were they were proposing that, you know, this might be a, a useful therapeutic, but I would argue that those mice probably felt terrible all the time. <laughs> yeah, because we say treating people with interferon is terrible. Right? Right, it's flu-like <laughs> symptoms, exactly. <laughs> so the, the mice probably felt badly, but they couldn't tell us. Yet they, they, they live, they don't have any pathology. No, they have no pathology. And in fact, they are immune to all infections because... Basically, their interferon system is so well primed yeah. that um, if an ISG doesn't stop the virus, certainly they are uh, capable of springing into action much faster so, as well. So, why does this tell us that RNAi and interferon are incompatible? Um, well, it tells us at least that an RNA-dependent RNA polymerase uh, can't be used in our in our cellular mm-hmm. defense armament, and that's because they would self-amplify. So, right now, interferon does not begat more interferon. Uh, and that's a really important feature of our interferon system because it's just as important to turn it off as it is to turn it on in a controlled manner. Mm-hmm. And so if you had an RNA-dependent RNA polymerase that now could generate right. RNA off another RNA template, you would always make the very substrate that Rig I or MDA5 recognizes. So right. you'd have this forward, feed, forward, forward feed, feedback loop that would basically constantly produce interferon, and we would all feel terrible all the time. Um, nothing would get done. If we had RNA polymerase. Correct. But um, what well, is we it? exhibit no pathology. That's true. We, we, <laughs> well, you you wouldn't be infected with viruses. That's different from not exhibiting. No, I meant that as a play. Thank you. For yes. That up. Actually, and you might be more susceptible to bacterial infections. So this right. yeah. don't get on a bus. So your assume- is suffering from this. So you, the assumption is that you would have to have an RNA polymerase in a big organism like us to have an RNAi system. That, that, in the, like in plants, correct, right? Correct. So a lot of this work yeah. ha- has been done in like banana trees, for example. So something that's of commercial interest. And mm-hmm. what they find is that the RNA-dependent RNA polymerases play an essential role in duplicating the pathogen-specific sRNAs throughout the entire tree. Okay, I got it. Yeah, in fact, you say in a review that the loss of RNA may have everything to do with RNA-dependent RNA polymerase biology. And that's basically it, right? That's That's, I mean... To be full disclosure, this is a uh, my opinion. Uh, yeah, of course, that's but fine. yeah, that's what I believe. Huh. Every time they ask so, me to write a review so, and I finish it, they call it a perspective. So I'm, I'm very opinionated. <laughs> so I would expect that this would actually be active on a DNA virus, wouldn't you? Uh, the drosha, you mean? Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, maybe I th- not, because I, I don't know how much structure they have in their messages. You know, the mm. the positive strand RNA viruses, I think have a lot of structure in their genomes just as part of the, you know, the whole packaging and everything else. Messenger RNAs in DNA viruses may not have these extended structures that uh, would be targets for drosia. It would certainly be easy to get rid of them, you would think, from a DNA virus point of view. Yeah. Right. You're thinking about the mRNAs coming out of the nucleus, uh, Rich, right? Yeah. Mm. What about an ancient organism? Can we infect them and show that drosia play some role um so uh, right now um uh, we're trying it with zebrafish and um the problem there again though is the beauty of no dice cells was that our baseline yeah, platform was right. in the absence of microRNA. so this yeah. is a bit of a problem um but we are trying to to go back siona is another really good one so siona mm-hmm. is a sea sponge that doesn't have interferon or rnai but does have drosia so it's actually a great yeah. candidate but you can imagine that the manipu- genetic manipulation yeah, of sure. Siona is a, is a little challenging. So we, we are trying to push forward in this way. We certainly aren't giving up. Yeah. But right now, our main interest is determining what actually moves it from the nucleus to the cytoplasm in this very specific manner. So Siona, you don't need a virus, or you do need a virus to, to do this experiment in Siona. Are there such things you can use? 
I don't know if a, Siona, a virus of Siona is known. It doesn't mean it's not. I just don't know. Well, you could use one of yours, mm-hmm. perhaps, and see if it can get in. Sure, right? sure. How do you spell that? C-E? It's C-I-O-N-A. Siona okay. intestinalis. Siona intestinalis. There you go. Sea squirts. You know, you know about sea squirts, Dixon? Heard the term. I have to put it that way. <laughs> nice. They have nice pictures. That's a great story. I love the evolutionary tie-in to the development of these RNA-based systems. And that's when I was reading uh, some of your reviews, and I thought, gee, he never wrote about this before. But as you said, it was going to uh, Vinucci's lab that did it. I think so. Yeah. That's pretty cool. So Thanks, did, you, did you go do and uh, did you do experiments or just kind of talk and think and? Uh, it was mostly talking and thinking. And this is at the Pasteur in yeah, Paris, yeah. so that is a good place to talk and think. It's a, it's a great institute. Wonderful place. And Carlos Sele is right there as well, so the, the combination of those two is is great. Did you get to see Louis' tomb? I did, I did. Isn't that impressive? Yes. That's very impressive. So did we explain properly why interferon is fundamentally incompatible with RNAi? Also, well, we haven't mentioned Chris Sullivan's direct work, actually. So in okay. addition to, we can't really have an RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. In right. addition to, there's no evidence of positive selection on our RNA machinery, our microRNA machinery. Mm-hmm. Um, Chris Sullivan, also, in addition to that, found that interferon plus virus infection, one of the first things you see in an interferon-primed cell that then gets infected is the ribosylation and destruction of the RNA-induced silencing complex. So huh. it would appear huh. that our microRNA biology is destroyed following virus infection. And, and hmm. um, so again, that's, that whole idea is very incompatible with the idea that RNAi is somehow still relevant, at least in somatic cells. And, and he has published this? Yeah, it was a cell host, a micro paper. First author is uh, CO, hmm. S-E-O, CO et al. Hmm. It's a great paper. Well, we're going to go to Austin next year. Maybe we'll talk with Chris. Yeah. What do you think, Dixon? Should we Have do that? some barbecue. <laughs> yeah, you ask him to take you swing dancing. That's probably a, oh, the most ride the, uh, ride unique the experience. Bowl? You know, come on. Rich and I were there a couple of years ago. He took us to a famous music place. And yeah, after, good fun. Austin City Limits. Uh, yeah, and we couldn't hear afterwards. <laughs> oh, right. <laughs> it was very loud. Right. He actually offered earplugs. Is there anything we missed, uh, Ben? Because this has been a great discussion, but I want to make sure that there's, there's some I point think I'm satisfied. You're satisfied? What's been brought up. And of course, we'll I'm probably... sorry if I've forgotten anybody's work or offended anybody. <laughs> no, no, that's okay. We, we understand. I found, I found something about Drosha, the name Drosha. Good. Uh-huh. It looks like, like it came from a 2000 paper from Valerie Filipov, Victor Soliev, Maria Filipova, and Sarjeet Gill in Gene, where, they, where they're looking at a Drosophila gene and they name it. Okay. Um, so... They say we name it Drosha, and they don't go into. They don't say why. So the DRO is probably Drosophila, yeah, right? I think right. so. Yeah, yeah. There, there was one last thing that we've sort of touched on, but I just want to wrap up. And it's these mice uh, with the RNA polymerase that are constitutively interferon. You know, I'm thinking if these mice are okay, then why would we select against um, RNA polymerase? If it's if there are no negative effects, but you said probably the mice really do feel badly, and there's probably a um, a, a fitness cost that ha- yeah doing you need this. to take them to the opera <laughs> yeah <laughs> right no they don't even want to go to the opera <laughs> right no, they don't feel good enough to do that yeah I, I imagine they feel like they have flu all the time that would be they're good. living so the opera but more importantly it's a, it's it's a selective pressure it, it is a fitness cost for evolution so you wouldn't maintain right that. right I don't think so and I mean our um, telomerase is in some ways an RNA dependent RNA polymerase so yeah. we see some evidence that that machinery would function and be okay in yeah. our cells, but we've sequestered it for a very specific function That's right. in the nucleus. That's right. As a matter of fact, those mice probably don't want to reproduce. They, <laughs> they have a headache all the time. Right. <laughs> <laughs> very good. The other thing I wanted to point out, you sent me an interesting link to your paper in Nature. Maybe you could explain oh, yeah. how so this I, I hope we didn't break any law here. Um, but so Nature, so I often hear you guys talk on these shows and um, we all begrudge the uh, publication journals for putting papers behind paywalls. And mm. I don't really want to get into that debate. But uh, one of the things that I received from Nature after publication was 
uh, a URL that allows you to share the paper, but it's a view only PDF and they encourage you to share it. So Vincent actually tweeted it out uh, a couple of days ago. And if you click on it, you can see everything in the paper, the supplemental Mm -hmm. data, the references, the figures, you can expand them on your screen, but you cannot print it and you cannot download it. Um, and I think it's kind of an interesting compromise. You can screenshot it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you can certainly. I guess very they, good, Dixon. I guess they figure that, that hey, that's, hey, hey, if you're going to do that much work, you could also just go to the Russian site and download it in 10 seconds. This so. is probably right. It's right next to the Trump. Uh. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, I wrote a, a a bit of Julie Youngner in uh, Nature Immunology, and it's behind a paywall. And some people were complaining. And I realized they had sent me a similar link, and I just threw it away because I, why do I need this? <laughs> but I'm going to now tweet that out to people who want to read the obit. Maybe you want to wait a week to see if Nature contacts me and tells me I'm uh, I owe them thousands and thousands of dollars in royalties. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, Especially like, for the color. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> All right, that was a great discussion. And uh, anyone have anything else before we move onwards? I do. Uh, this is yes. this is terrific. Yes, Kathy. It's, it's actually not the science. It's related to uh, Paul writing to us about Tivoli and Tivoli. So it turns out that Tivoli, Italy, is the home of uh, the Villa d'Est, so the famous gardens and the extensive ruins of yep. Hadrian's Villa. Yes. And then many things were named after that. So the Jardin de Tivoli in Paris uh, was built after the Villa d'Est in Tivoli, Italy. Tivoli Gardens in Copenhagen was named after the Parisian Garden. There's Tivoli, Japan, based on the park in Copenhagen, <laughs> and it's turtles all the way down with Tivoli's. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Tivoli's all the way down. <laughs> and also, there's a radio, and I have a radio, a Tivoli radio. They're really nice uh, radio. Oh, yeah, I remember those. Those are the wooden ones? Mm-hmm. Yeah, those are cool. All right, Kathy, let me pronounce it for you. Villa d'Este. Villa d'Este, okay. Sorry. Good. I, we, no, we, I, right. I have gone many years ago. Yeah, it's about uh, 30 kilometers from Rome. Right. Okay, thank you. Uh, ben, we're going to do some picks now. I don't know if you have one or if... I do maybe, have one. Well, okay. I came good. prepared. You came prepared, very because you're a listener, so you of know... Of course I'm a listener, pick. since I episode feel, one. I feel badly when, I, when we ask guests if they have a pick and they say no, and I figure maybe I should have warned them ahead of time or... Whatever, but uh, what, no, no, what no. do you have for us? So it's, it's a book. Uh, uh, that's not too cliche, but not um, at all. It, this is the book that got me hooked on viruses. And it has not been mentioned on TWIV uh. to date. It's called The Invisible Invaders. Uh, the author is Peter Odetsky. Uh, he was a writer for Discovery. Uh, and it's written, every chapter is divided by virus. And it just mm. tells great stories of the history of Discovery or uh, economic importance or socioeconomic importance of those viruses. Um, and it, it's just a, it's a great way for anybody to learn more about virology and the great stories that, that go into um, the research of them. Yeah. I've recently heard someone mention that. I don't remember the context, but I've heard it many times. So when did you read this in your career? Very, very early on? Oh no, I was such a cliche medical student in college. So first year of college, I had no interest in microbiology or uh-huh. going into viruses. <laughs> and um, This is at McGill, right? Right. And so actually it was a combination of this book, uh, The Invisible Invaders, and a professor named Mike Dubow, um, who was at microbiology at McGill, who was just this phenomenal, charismatic teacher Mm -hmm. uh, who just, there was no way you could leave a class not totally in love with phage or measles or mumps or whatever was the topic for that day. Uh, I think he's still, I think he's still around. He's in France now, from what I understand, Mm -hmm. but I haven't spoken to him in ages, but if he's listening, thanks, Mike. If you're interested in this pick, by the way, uh, people should follow the link in the show notes uh, rather than Google, because Google will take you straight to a 1959 B horror movie. Yeah. yeah. I I can't speak to that one. So, um, that changed you from pre-med to thinking about research? Is yeah, that right? no, I, uh, so after Mike DeBow's class in this book, I completely switched my major from biology to microbiology and uh, went to do a PhD after that and never looked back. That's great. It's just, I love stories like that. Alan, what do you have for us? I have, um, this one's been sitting in my queue for uh, probably a few weeks, um, uh, uh, just a fascinating little research project that some guy did where he mapped all of the roads of ancient Rome. <laughs> now, okay. Rome Rome was known for its road network, and this is what maintained their empire to a large extent. And uh, 
Uh, but this guy found that there was no comprehensive map of the whole thing. Huh. So he went and researched it, which was apparently a heck of a lot of work because it was all, you know, in fragmented sources and in different places. Um, and, but then he put together what I find absolutely charming is this map of the system that is designed like a subway map. <laughs> <laughs> so it's yeah, very schematic. This is brilliant. It's, it, it's right. not, you know, a, a direct uh, topo map or anything. It's just, uh, and the the cities are mapped as stations uh, or stasios, and then uh, you also have you also have some of the the links that um, because the empire fell um, that weren't completed. So you have some uh, via futuras and stasio futuras um, shown in dotted lines, just like they would be on a system under construction. Mm. This would make a great poster. Yes, yeah, I, th- I think he sells it as a poster he as does. well. He does. Oh, that's really cool. <laughs> who was the original person who did this subway map thing? Wasn't there one person that did it? No, there you- was, right, the designer of the New York subway map, I think, originated this concept of of not making it an exact geographical mm-hmm. representation, but a schematic representation. Rally Dadamo. Rally Dadamo. Okay. Hmm. I think that was it. Or maybe it was Massimo Vignelli, uh, an Italian designer, blah, blah, blah. No, no, that wasn't him. The first hit is New York City subway map designed by Dadamo, 1967. Hmm. Could that have been the precursor of all? 67? I think it might have been. Wow. Well, the map. I mean, the subway's older, of what course. What the hell did they do before that? <laughs> they had no. They had maps, but they were they were maps. They Massimo. Were like, Got it. So it's, yeah, there are two it's... people here. Massimo Vignelli explains his iconic 1972 New York City subway map. 1972. Wow. And then, but there's another wow. guy here, Rally Dadamos. Anyway, I'm sure someone will write in and tell us. Yes. That's very cool. So I know I notice on this that all roads lead to Rome. <laughs> well, not well, quite. No, there are some that are, that are <laughs> right. There are some that are like disconnected lines, um, yeah. you know, like the L train <laughs> or something. But um, a lot of them do do in fact lead to Rome. Rich, what do you have for us? Uh, so, uh, I recently visited my son in Seattle. On the way back, we actually we all came back to Sun River, the two families, and uh, spent some time in the Columbia River Gorge. Wow. And so I just want to shout out to the Columbia River Gorge. I had, you know, I've uh, crossed the Columbia River many times and traveled on 84 along the Columbia River. And it's uh, always uh, been interesting. But uh, spend a, spending a couple of days there makes me want to spend a couple of weeks there. So I've uh, linked a site to the Columbia River Gorge National Scenic Area that um, uh, is a... USPS, actually, it's a USDA, I believe, resource uh, uh, that it's describes forest, forest service or forest uh, service. VA is forest service. That's for, true. Forest service. Okay. That's right. uh, that uh, um, describes all the different activities you can do there. We went to a dam. We took a just one <laughs> boat. Uh, yeah, we took us the the bottom one. What is it? The I forget where, which the the one closest to the mouth of the river i forget bonneville the bonneville dam right That's we went huge. to a hatchery we hiked to a falls we went to a discovery center uh, and just drove around and it's just gorgeous and i'm linking to this this is a Bonneville. compound pick a book uh, by stephen ambrose called undaunted courage which is about the lewis and clark expedition because of course that ended up uh walking along the columbia river gorge uh and is just a uh you know a magnificent um, treatise on exploration of the West. There's probably other, plenty of other Lewis and Clark books, but that's the one I've read. So I encourage people to look into this. And if you're ever out uh, in the West in the Portland area, uh, spend some time there. It's great. Cool, Rich. If you if you go there for a few weeks, you need to make sure there's internet. Okay. <laughs> okay. I'll do that. Because you can't miss <laughs> Twib for three, four, five weeks. Uh, uh, around, yeah. yeah, actually, I think Lewis and Clark had internet, so there must be. <laughs> <laughs> they had connections, let's put it this way. <laughs> Dixon, what do you have? I have a remarkable <clears throat> visual. It's a visual. It's a playable visual of earthquakes from the year 2002 to 2015. <clears throat> and, or 2001, excuse me. And you can just 
hit the play button and sit there and be absolutely astounded. It's it looks like a set of explosions going. In fact, it is a set of explosions <laughs> going off, and you can see see every tectonic plate in the in the uh, the entire Earth, and it's fabulous. And you now know where to live and where not to live. <laughs> yeah, I'll say you don't want to be you don't want to be you don't want to live Holy in the South Pacific. Cow. That looks yeah, but a lot of people do though. That's the point. Yeah. Look along that rim, and you can see. An intense population in Japan and in well, other remember though that too. earthquakes are not the only hazard. This is true. But what what other hazards are there? <laughs> oh, tornadoes and hurricanes. fires, fires, and hurricanes. And that's right. Every I, place has something. You got it. You got it. Yeah, but, cool. but it is notable yeah. here that Kansas California has boredom. Has <laughs> California has everything. Yeah. So. Yeah, this is get, great. I guess they don't get typhoons much in It's California. a great animation. It's amazing. It and you know what? So I said to Vincent when I showed them this to begin with, I said, you should have something like this for every uh, outbreak of, 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 of a disease that's either vector-borne or airborne or, or born in a certain way like food-borne illnesses. It would be great to see how the epidemiology of this spreads out from the source to the world based on uh, your visual uh, connection and I, I've never seen anything like this. So there this. are maps like Google Health, right? Yeah, maps go, is okay. But it's not animated. <laughs> no, it's, it's not animated. But it could, it could easily be done. Like West Nile virus. I, they have the archival data. Sure. sure. When West Nile first broke out in 1999 here, and now it's clearly entrenched into the wildlife and human populations, to see how that actually occurred in real time, uh, well, it's speeded up real time, uh, to show the progression and then to connect that with weather and lots of other, you can do whatever you want with this kind of a map. I love it. I just love it. It's very cool. Yeah. Kathy, what do you have? I picked, uh, well, first of all, Vincent, you need to make sure you put in the link to the answer to the Virolympics puzzle. Will do. Uh -huh. Which I sent you. And I also picked something that I did on vacation and that is went to the national museum of the air force, which is at Wright Patterson air force base near Dayton, Ohio. And we spent <laughs> about three and a half hours there, and we saw maybe a quarter of it. There are hundreds and hundreds of airplanes, and it's like they've just added the fourth building. And in a small fraction of that building, they have uh, various Air Force One planes, including the most recent of the large ones, yeah. um, which I included in a picture for you guys. And that fourth building also has a lot of experimental aircraft, things that uh, it didn't really work well, <laughs> like this <laughs> flying saucer shaped thing that yeah. uh, this is only a third of the size of what they hoped to have it ultimately be. <laughs> and it was going to fly at Mach 1. But when they tested this thing, it hubcapped. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so now we mock it. <laughs> so, uh, but the it was just fascinating, all kinds of really cool stuff. So if you're on a road trip, Anywhere near Dayton, spend a little time at this museum. Dayton, Ohio. This looks absolutely terrific. Uh, uh, my wife and I watched um, First in this, hi this, <laughs> this History Channel thing on Amelia uh, Earhart, which I wouldn't necessarily recommend, the other, the other night. And <laughs> exactly. They, uh, exactly. They went to, I think it was this museum that they went to, to uh, look at a plane that looked like hers, the yeah. Electra. I Lockheed Electra. Yeah. yeah, Lockheed Electra. Mm -hmm. I, I went to this museum when I was a kid, and it it has apparently grown quite a bit since then. But yeah, this I, I've got to get back there sometime. Yeah, definitely. I had been, I think, a long, 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 long time ago, and it's it, yeah. I'll send you another picture, Alan, of the building itself. It's <laughs> impressive. You know, as far as airplanes go, another cool place to go is outside of Tucson. They have the graveyard of airplanes. Have you, right. anyone ever been there? Ah, uh, yeah. I've seen oh, it's so cool. Pictures of it. the, yeah, you can walk underneath. B-52s yeah, yeah, and all yeah. kinds of stuff. And they're yeah, just sitting yeah. there rusting and rotting. Yeah. But and then the Aerospace Museum awesome. in Washington it's is another great That's artist. another one. That's yeah. great, too. Yeah. And Kitty Hawk. Have you ever been to Kitty Hawk? It's fabulous. Yeah. I am planning at some point, I haven't gotten around to it yet, but I want to fly in there. Uh, <laughs> that would a, be funny. <laughs> no, there's, yeah, yeah. there's an the, airport, First Flight Airport, which is right, right there that's on right. the site next yeah. to... You can you can land right next to where the Wright brothers took off. Um, so it's kind of a required pilgrimage for pilots. And <laughs> make it there sometime. Like the Pasteur Institute. <laughs> right. Exactly. Uh, my pick is an article at the Howard Hughes website. 
It's called Artificial Intelligence Helps Build Brain Atlas of Fly Behavior. And this is an article about a journal article in Cell uh, where they took, uh, they used a machine learning program to annotate uh, videos of flies moving around and what the movement did to their brains, to their neurons, basically. 225 days of videos. So now you could see if a fly moves in a certain way, what cells light up in the brain and so forth. Amazing. Brain, brain regions, for example, associated with an increase in walking. Okay, so you can play Jeez. through these. This would have taken humans 3,800 years to do <laughs> by hand. <laughs> so this is so what, cool. What, what I found <laughs> remarkable is that it takes very, very little brain to chase females. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, Rich. Oh, Rich. You would say something like that, wouldn't you? Actually, yeah, I wouldn't I wouldn't predict you would, actually, at all, but that's pretty <laughs> funny. And it takes a lot more just to walk. Anyway, check that yeah. out. The article is in Cell. That's very cool. I have a couple of listener picks. Kathy, why don't you tell us about the ones from Rob? Okay, so on the plane from Madison to Detroit after ASV, uh, I ended up sitting next to Rob, and he has written into TWIV before, uh, uh, something about epigenetics, I remember, if I remember correctly. And he works on EBV, and he's from London in the UK. And he had come to the ASV in London, Ontario. So this was his second ASV. And he just said, oh, and by the way, here's a couple of listener picks for you. So he's a regular <laughs> regular listener. So I jotted them down, and here they are. One is Mitch Ben from The Now Show on BBC Radio 4 called Vaccinate Your Kids. And the other one is a YouTube from Horrible Histories Series 4, very Charles Darwin Natural Selection. It's a riot. That's a riot. Actually, the Vaccinate Your Kids one, both are great. The Vaccinate Your Kids one is absolutely brilliant. I love it. Cool. I also got a couple of pics from Islam Hussein, who is the creator of Virovlog in Arabic, videos about viruses in Arabic. He sent a link to Science Within Reach dot com which has um this very interesting self-assembling virus kit it's basically all the subunits of a virus particle you put them in a, a jar and shake it and it self-assembles which is very cool cool wow. unfortunately they're 90 bucks each uh which is a bit steep i don't know why they're so expensive Since everyone's buying them now the price will really go down uh, well you know <laughs> viruses are cheap and they self-assemble so. that's true and and these should be easy to make yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Exactly right. He also sent a link to um, the same creators who have made a bunch of uh, videos, and one of them is Virus: The Beauty of the Beach, where they have a kind of the video on one side, and then they have some illustrations on the other, which is a cool way to put it. And they go through. Unfortunately, this. they use autoplay, but there you go. Yeah, you know the new uh, browser is all going to be able to. The new Safari coming out in the fall is going to be have an anti uh, autoplay. And I'm sure others already have it as well. Yeah, I think you can plug that in on Firefox. Virus, viruspatterns.com and sciencewithinreach.com. Check them out. And that'll do it for TWIV 450. You can find it at microbe.tv slash TWIV. And if you listen on your mobile device, which most people do now, on your, your smartphone or your tablet, you know, you use a program to listen to podcasts. Just subscribe to us so that every episode gets downloaded. Uh, we would like you to subscribe because then we get the higher numbers and that's good for our advertisers and we can get more advertising to support the show. So we'd like you to do that. Go to your favorite podcatcher, search for TWIV or whatever you'd like in our family of podcasts and subscribe to it. Consider supporting us if you like what we do. Go over to microbe.tv slash contribute. We have multiple ways you can help us out, including a Patreon account where you can give a buck a month if you'd like or you can give a thousand bucks a month if you're bill gates yeah help us out bill or warren buffett why don't you, why don't they give us money a month they could afford it right? you just have to ask <laughs> who do i ask where do, what's the email <laughs> see it's there's this teflon shield between yeah, those yeah. People. <laughs> there are other ways you can help us too and you go to the microbe.tv slash contribute to find out and please send your questions and comments to twiv at microbe.tv our guest today has been from the mount sinai school of medicine ben tenuver thank you ben thank you it was, it was great a pleasure a lot of fun Enjoy being back. Come back sometime uh, when you get that next paper. You're welcome anytime. <laughs> All right. Thank Since you're you. here in New York uh, you. and you love viruses, you're welcome to come back anytime. Absolutely. Dixon de Palmier, the livingriver.org. Indeed. 
vir- parasitic, no, what's the, uh, wait Parasites. a minute. Parasiteswithoutborders.com. Thank yep. you, Dixon. You're welcome. Did you learn about Drosha? A lot. I Drosha. did. Drosha. Drosha. <laughs> Drosha. <laughs> Kathy Spindler's at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Thank you, Kathy. Thanks. This is a lot of fun. And I didn't get to tell you the weather, but it's 78 degrees, blue sky, puffy clouds. I'm sorry. Really? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Boy, that's quite different from where we are. <laughs> I know. That's very why I cloud, wanted to very cloudy, bring it up. Sorry for wow. the audio trouble at the beginning, Kathy. My fault. No worries. And I'm glad We're we here. sorted it out. Rich yep. Condit is an emeritus professor, University of Florida at Gainesville, currently at Sun River in Oregon. Very good. All right. Thank uh, you, Rich. Always a good time. Yeah, you're welcome. I, might, I should have mentioned Ben is at Virus Ninja on Twitter, right, Ben? That's correct. Virus Ninja. Subscribe, follow him. That handle just comes from Game of Clones, to be fair. <laughs> uh, but it's great. It's a great handle, yeah. Alan Dove is at alandove.com. You can find him on Twitter by Alan Dove. He's also at turbidplaque.com. Thank you, Alan. Thank you. It's always a pleasure. I'm Vincent Yellow. You can find me at virology.ws. The introductory music on TWIV is composed and performed by Ronald Jenkins. You can find his work at ronaldjenkins.com. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week another twiv is viral.